area that's um, we're finding the increasingly interesting is AI. And this, the particular application I wanted to talk about here is, is pathfinding. Um, and let me just explain the picture on the right and then talk about a few scenarios and sort of more generally about this. The problem here is you've got a bunch of robots. Um, this is actually a picture from a simulation that one of the, the researcher um, who is doing the work on this put together, Avi uh, Blyweiss. But basically the picture is, you get, or the problem is you've got a bunch of robots sort of sitting in alcoves and their job is to basically walk from, from one side of the scene to the other without running into things, without running into each other, and follow natural paths. You know, you don't want them to like walk out and hit this and then walk over here and then walk down, you know, following some Manhattan path, but to follow a fairly natural path. Now in a game, if you wanted um, game assets to do that kind of thing, someone would have to author all of that in terms of figuring out how to coordinate all of these different characters in the environment. <coughs> so, I mean, this is something that essentially all games have some form of pathfinding behavior. If they have AI in it, they have to figure out how to get from A to B. They all do something like this to some degree. Right. So, this work basically, um, first of all, finding a general solution to this, particularly very, with very large numbers of of uh, synthetic characters is very compute intensive. Turns out that it's also extremely highly parallel, so it's very well suited to the GPU. And it's basically finding um, a shortest path search through the environment, you know, based on including various constraints, both static constraints, objects that are sort of sitting there, where are their hallways, where are their doors, things like that, but also dynamic constraints where there are other characters, whether they're synthetic or whether they're actually um, other people in the game. So, um, I guess, you know, the punchline in terms of architecturally, it's much faster than GT200, but imagine you're in an environment where you're a character in a game and you're standing in a crowd of people on a sidewalk waiting for the light to change. And there's a similar crowd on the other side of the street. And there's maybe three people in, in sort of your little group that are sort of game players, and then there's, you know, 50 people who are synthetic. Think about the problem of walking across that street with 50 other people and a big crowd coming towards you and navigating that complex interaction. It's, I think today it's probably impossible to sort of do that a priori you know, in some sort of descriptive fashion, and it's very compute intensive to solve that kind of problem. But if you want to have an immersive environment, where people kind of believe they're in a crowd of people and the people are behaving sort of naturally, it's a problem you have to solve. So it's just, I think that to, to create games that are even more immersive and sort of more believable, there's a lot more computational power that needs to be brought to bear. Um, so, Pathfinder is, uh, is sort of another place where you can bring uh, lots of computing horsepower to bear and it's a, is very well suited to uh, GPU. <coughs> okay, here's a uh, an example that was put together using uh, the toolkit that I mentioned earlier, Physex. Um, this is just a yes, this is a, a very realistic um, fluid simulation. I was going to say water, but it doesn't really look like water. Um, it looks more like lime jello or something. Um, but very, very large numbers of particles, it models surface tension. Um, in terms of the performance increases, um, this should say, probably should say GF100. Fermi is our internal, internal, internal name <laughs> for GF100. Um, but we get a big speed up in terms of the architectural improvements uh, on this particular, on this particular compute workload. And, you know, fluids effects show up in lots of places. I'm trying to remember, this was, this was several years ago where I saw someone, um, I was visiting somebody and they showed me this uh, simulation that they'd run <coughs> offline to model someone walking through some tunnel and like a, uh, basically the tunnel flooded very rapidly. So there's this turbulent water coming, rushing through the tunnel, kind of enveloping the character I mean, and in interacting with the whole environment. And at that time, it, it had to be done offline. Um, it was impossible to model something like that. So it's another place where there's 
huge amounts of computation necessary to bring to bear dynamic realism. You, know, you can do it in the film industry, but it's all done offline. Um, another, I guess another thing I want to touch on here is that um, a feature of, uh, of GF900 is the ability to run concurrent kernels. Now, what is a kernel? You know, a kernel is a, sort of a small unit of computation. It happens that in, in some settings, uh, physics being one of them, sometimes you have a large number of smaller sort of workloads that you need to run. And in the past, we actually had to run those sort of serially on our processors. And now um, we can actually run them all in parallel concurrently. And it was just, a, it was an architectural limitation. But what that does is it leads to much, much greater, a much more efficient utilization of the processor. So you get a you know, big performance boost there. Jonas? Yeah, so we're, we're looking at more, there's more and more things that we see can be done within, within physics, different kinds of physics simulations. And of course, the more, the more active simulations you're going to do, the more you want to make sure that you can run those all very efficiently. You don't have to have one run and then it completely has to stop when you start the next one, et cetera. So this was uh, one of our compute investments that was really motivated a lot by physics and by, uh, by computing for the gaming type applications. Because the high performance computing, that's more a sort of a big, just one, one big simulation for an hour kind of thing. But physics is, you know, every, every frame is doing a bunch of different Right. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic. We're going from this place where we didn't have enough computational power to now we need to run a bunch of concurrent workloads in order to fill up the machine. You know, as we go out in time, the processors are going to become increasingly capable and they'll need to be able to run more and more kind of concurrent work in order to completely saturate them. I, mean, well, I guess a little, a little yeah. bit more on that is um, it's certainly possible to write a game that completely fills up machine with physical simulation for any one kind of physics. Sure. I mean, in fact, in, in the rocket sled demo, which you're going to see and hear a lot about, there's modes where we can re render a million, you know, pieces of rubble. It, artistically, it doesn't look quite as good as the 100,000 or 10,000 pieces of rubble. It's computationally better, right, because there's more stuff to do. But instead of making everyone put a million pieces of rubble in the game, put Put the 10 or 20,000 pieces of rubble along with some cloth simulation, along with some AI simulation, along with all these other things that are going on. You know, that, then you can really make efficient use of the machine without you know, artificially just going crazy, saturating with rubble or particles and stuff like that. Okay. Um, Chichi, please. Mm -hmm. How many cores can we use simultaneously in physics? How many, I'm sorry, how many kernels can be used on oh, okay. How many kernels can be used? Yeah, I don't know the answer. Yeah, so it's up to, up to 16. 16, 16, 16, 16, 16 each current kernel. Each processor can be running a separate kernel. Each SM. Each SM, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Actually, stick that on the slide. We did actually just go right through the slide. Just that's, uh, just mention, we said that, so that, that's coming in the PhysX 3.0 release. So <coughs> PhysX is basically. We're we're uh, we're finding it to take advantage of this capability. Uh, this is the next and the next release will this three hour release will happen. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Okay. So um, so Dark Void is a game where we've actually uh, made use of uh, made use of physics, and we'll I guess we'll drop into a demo in a few minutes, or actually probably less than that. But there are a variety of places in the game. We've been able to use uh, physics to model fracture, to model turbulence, which is what you're seeing here. There's emitters, and uh, it's probably on a rocket or something flying through there, but basically to model the turbulence of um, something flying through space. We just go to the demo and just point out the Yeah. There. Um, so, you set? Yeah, so, why don't we you get up and head on here? Let's walk to Mark. Yeah. Oh, so, this is Mark Smith. He's uh, an evangelist, which is one of the people that works with 